Beginning of a new church year. It's the first Sunday of Advent. We'll be using the order of service in the new book uh, called Morning Prayer. It's on page 207. The psalm this morning, and we'll use it all four Sundays of Advent, is Psalm 24. I'd like you to turn to that for a moment. Psalm 24 in the front of the blue hymnal. Welcome to King of Glory. We'll be singing the refrain in the first set. You'll notice that the uh, song is set up, the tones, uh, there are four measures. The first and the third measure, the last note goes up. And on the uh, second and fourth, the last note goes up. We'll play the refrain once more, please. Thank <laughs> you. 
again, we're following the order on page 207.
Testament reading for the first Sunday Advent is recorded in the prophet Isaiah, reading in chapter 2. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, reading in chapter 13. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come to you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel, which is also today's sermon text, is from Matthew chapter 24. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour and you do not expect him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Our sermon hymn is number 315. Please be seated. <coughs> Thank you. 
Grace and peace are ours through our Lord Jesus Christ. Earthquakes, famines, pandemics, wars, violent mass shootings, they are all signs of the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are like vultures, vultures of the judgment circling in the sky as the return of Jesus gets always closer. It has been said in a certain sense that there has been no history since 70 AD when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. All the signs of Jesus returned since the fall of Jerusalem in those days. All the signs are one closing of the curtain on the world. And that may sound a little strange, but I think we can understand it as Christians if we consider what Peter writes in his second epistle. He says, in the last days, mockers following their own impulses will come with their mockery and say, he promised to come. What has happened? From the time the fathers fell asleep, everything has remained as it was since the world was first created. Do not forget, dear brothers, the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day the Lord is not slow to do what he promised as some people think rather he is patient with you because he does not want any to perish but wants all to come to repentance what is so clear and understood by Christians as signs of the end and of Jesus' imminent return. The non-believer scoffs at as ordinary and coincidental. But Jesus' final advent is described by him in today's gospel as, first of all, decisive, as well as divisive. The unbelieving world likes to ignore the matter of accountability. People of this world have always ignored the possibility of a day of reckoning, a day on which each person will be called to give an account to answer for how they have lived their lives. Jesus, in our text, describes the world at his return as being like the world in the days of Noah. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Noah is described by Peter in his second epistle as a preacher of righteousness, but people's ears were closed to the word of God. But it wasn't just what Noah was saying, it was also what he was doing. He and his three sons were overseeing the building of an ark. It was an imposing nautical structure, a boat or a very large barge, out in the middle of nowhere, far from water. It was three stories tall, 45 feet high. It was a football and a half feet long, 450 feet long and 75 feet wide. But you know, the people of Noah's day, their ears and their eyes were closed to Noah's call to repent. The Lord gave them 120 years of grace in which to repent, to turn from their rebellious ways and to come to a knowledge of the truth. But their hands kept grabbing for material, physical treasures of this world rather than the heavenly treasures. At the end, they were sunk, literally sunk. Rain 40 days and 40 nights, the fountains of the deep were open. Water came from below and from above and rose 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain peak of that time. And the water was sustained there for 150 days, five months. There's no way anyone could stay 
dog paddling or floating without food. Oh, there was plenty of water. But no life other than what God had put into the ark and safely closed the door on it survived. In the end, they all sunk. Things were deceptively normal right up to the day when God closed the ark. Noah and his family safely inside. Jesus says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all, all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. To the non-believing world, our Lord's merciful delay seems anything but definite or decisive. The world's attitude is like people after an earthquake, head for the lounges and bars for aftershock parties, in spite of the warnings that things could happen again even worse than the first earthquake. The Savior did not reflect on a chronological point of time for his return. Jesus did not tell us the year, the month, the day, the hour, the minutes. If I were to stand up here and say, December 31st, 2022, I don't know that. Jesus didn't tell anyone when the end is coming. He hasn't told his church. So anyone who dares to speak for the Lord when the Lord has not spoken to them is a hypocrite. Jesus simply says, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The church is mixed in with the perishing, with the unbelieving world, and that means that we are at risk if we don't pay attention to what our Lord says. We'll be tempted by the same things that the world is tempted by to think like the world, to act like the world. Therefore, the Lord's warning. He's not warning us so that we flee the world like hermit monks, like Simon Stylides, who chose to flee the world and lived on top of a stone pillar. Something like climbing to the top of one of the cathedral spires in Custer State Park and living there. Simon Stylides lived on top of a pillar for 37 years. People ask the natural question, how did he eat and drink and poop? That's a good question. The Lord wants us living in readiness with our feet on the ground, like Noah, calling the world around us to repentance, doing evangelism. We're not talking about grabbing people by the collar and saying, brother, are you saved? We're talking about a simple use of the opportunity so that the people you interact with know at least that you are a Christian. They may also know that you attend Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church here in Custer. You may also have the opportunity or create the opportunity to talk about your hope of heaven through Jesus' redeeming cross, that you look for a chance to talk about grace. Early in my ministry, I was assigned to a brand new mission congregation and I don't know if it was the goal of the mission board or if it was just my youthful enthusiasm for doing the job right, but it was expected of us that we would go door to door, ringing doorbells, taking a 
religious census of where people were or weren't going to church and then invite them to ours. And there was a lot of guilt because there were no results in doing that. And I'm not saying that that's what evangelism necessarily is. It's one form of evangelism that on someone's front porch you can talk about what our congregation teaches. We have been blessed in the last two years since the pandemic with the ability to broadcast our church services by SoundCloud, YouTube, Facebook Live, and it's repeated. And you know, you can simply press share. And you can go down your list of contacts and decide, is it time to share it with this person? What if they're offended? And well, if they're offended, you say, I was thinking about you. I care about you. But you know, the message of our church is, and in one or two sentences, you can talk about God's grace in Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of the world. And then say, well, if you don't like it, I won't do that again. But you've done it. You've shared the gospel. You can do that on Facebook. And you can also do it on your email by forwarding it to anybody who's on your forwarding list. Over the years, I have found that my greatest opportunity as a pastor to do evangelism, before we had the ability to broadcast worldwide as we do now, is funerals. Friends of the dead would come to the church service and we would present the gospel in its simple truth to total strangers. We don't know the precise moment of Jesus' second advent. But that doesn't make that moment any less definite or decisive. Four times in our text, Jesus says, Your Lord will come. The Son of Man will come. That day will be decisive. And it will be divisive. In the days of Noah, everything seemed normal. Jesus says, but the flood came and took them all away. Noah and his family were saved. Both examples in our text show us believers mixed in with unbelievers. Workers in the field, women sitting across from each other, grinding flour in a mill. We are in the world. That is where the Lord has placed us. We have work to be doing. Call it evangelism. It's simply encouraging each other and reaching out to those who we don't know yet, whether they are part of the gospel. Our Savior's call to watchfulness and readiness reminds us not to be confused about our calling, not to be confused with the things and with the people of this perishing world. We're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. The end will come suddenly, and it will divide between close friends and sadly maybe also between members of a family, between members of a family circle. Jesus' example speaks of two people working in a field, perhaps on opposite ends of the field. Joe is down there and Harry's down there. Joe is taken up to the Lord, meets the Lord in the air, and the other is left. They're not intimately connected with each other, except maybe at lunchtime when they're done working in the field. The other example is a little bit more intimate. Jesus speaks of two women sitting cross-legged around a stone donut-type stone flour mill, their hands touching as one pulls and the other pushes. They're sitting cross-legged, and there's this big stone donut. One pulls and the other pushes, and their hands touch. Someone that close to you may not know the gospel or has rejected the gospel and will be left behind. 
All speculation about a science fiction type rapture is silly and pointless. What will happen to those left behind, people wonder. As if there's going to be a big time lag of a year or two before the end of the world comes. The scriptures, especially in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will join them and meet the Lord in the air. That will be divisive. The believers go to be with the Lord and the unbelievers left behind. That's the judgment. And there will be hot fire and brimstone for those who have rejected the gospel. The master is purposeful and vague about all the details. But he is coming. It will be decisive. It will be the most decisive moment in world history. And it will be divisive. Dividing between believers and unbelievers. Keep watch, Jesus says. You must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. We continue our worship with in 313. a ray of hope in the promise of the Messiah. Graciously help us to rejoice in that promise and prepare for his coming. As the citizens of Jerusalem welcome Christ with shouts of Hosanna, grant that we too rejoice in his coming. Unlike the citizens of Jerusalem, let us recognize him as our Savior from sin and our hope for everlasting life. We long for that peace promised by Isaiah, when nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Help us to realize that Christ came to bring a higher and more enduring peace between us and your divine majesty. As a king whose kingdom is not of this world, a 
from everlasting to everlasting, grant that Christ may always rule our hearts. Keep us awake and alert that we may suddenly always be found ready for the end time when he shall suddenly appear as the judge of all. Help us to conduct ourselves as become those who bear your name, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Bless our witness to his peace, which comes as your gift to us. Grant, O Lord, that our lips and lives be a reflection of hearts that are truly thankful for your great mercy. This we ask in the name of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Savior, Jesus Christ. O God, you have called your servants to ventures of faith of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Dick says, late happy Thanksgiving to all at Custer Shepherd of the Hills. Thanks for posting services on YouTube. We are not on Facebook, but do get on YouTube. It was good to view your Thanksgiving service on Thanksgiving Day. We also had Wednesday evening service here. That's at Mitchell side. We are staying well and hope all of you are also Dick and Bernie Noble. A special thank you to Janine for uh, working through uh, morning prayer. This was so very, very similar to um, the Red Book. Uh, the organist copy. The pages stick together. The pages stick together yet. And uh, for instance, setting three for communion. Uh, she had to photocopy the pages because it required the changing of five pages. Uh, so she copied them and taped them together so the whole uh, organ uh, easel there is one long musical piece. It was not uh, planned with our organists in mind. You'll notice that the altar book is still rather stiff when it uh, closes. I'm glad I have bookmarks. Everyone here is invited to be a part of our potluck today, whether you were aware of it or not, whether you were able to bring something or not, I'm sure we'll have plenty of things. Nate? With the Christmas program next Sunday, is there going to be communion Sunday? No, uh, thank you for bringing that up. We'll have communion on the second Sunday and then on the fourth Sunday, which is Christmas Day. Uh, my wife tells me that she saw uh, questions about whether churches were going to have church on Christmas Day because Christmas is for the family. And uh, as a pastor, the day of Christmas is about Christ. And uh, what better way of sharing that with our family than to be together at church or uh, at least around the Christmas tree, uh, singing Christmas hymns, and perhaps reciting from memory Luke 2 together. But we will have church on Christmas Day, and it will be a communion service, and a lot of Christmas hymns to be sung. Any other questions? Thank you.